Hello, welcome to uh, God's Eagle Ministries. My name is Ambassador Mandi Orejo Gwajo Ogbe. At God's Eagle Ministries, we are seeding the nations with God's word and God himself is transforming lives through his timeless truth. One content at a time. We are one in Christ Jesus. Let's stay one. Evangelism, discipleship, uh, healing, counseling, healing, deliverance and restoration and prayer with our walls, brothers and denomination. This is episode 22 of our series on perfect relationship, 24 tools for building bridges to harmony and taking down walls of conflicts in our relationship. So uh, the title today is uh, in, in the theology of wounded parents. We're continuing with God's continuing, continuing parenthood and um, destroying every new relationship as we relate to people. And so, Father, we just ask that to you bread life upon this uh, series, episode 22. Let it bring life, let it bring healing, let it bring deliverance, let it bring restoration to our relationships, not just with our family, not just with the church, but also to the wider world, with the wider world, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for answer prayer. In Jesus, amen and amen. So, God's continuing parenthood. God loves your children infinitely more than you do. He has their best interests at heart. He will not abandon them or forsake them because of their behavior. Your children were God's gift to you. And if you have given them back to God in prayer, you can trust him to do his loving best to guide them back into the path of righteousness. The psalmist had such abiding faith in God's continuing parenthood that he could say that even if his father and mother forsook him, the Lord would take him up. Psalms 27.10 if as Christian parents, you once dedicated your children to the Lord, and in recent years one of them has gone astray, he or she is not out of God's reach. He knows where that son or daughter is, what he or she is doing and thinking, and will not abandon that child. He will continue in his watchful care, his pursuit, his calling to return, and his loving provision. Although the influence of our parenting may be blocked by circumstances and rebellious rejection, God's continuing parenthood cannot be stopped by wayward children. The freedom of man and the sovereignty of God. All through the Bible, it is clear that God has given to each one of us the freedom to choose, to make our own decisions. If one is to be free to do the right, one must also be free to do the wrong. Your children had the freedom to do whatever he or she did. Why a son or daughter chooses a lifestyle that disappoints his or her parents is another, often unanswerable question. But he or she was free to choose. You would not want it any other way. No parent wants robots for children, any more than God wants humans to be ro robots. Love is meaningless if it is not freely chosen. Obedience and respect are empty decisions, if not freely made. When God made man, he ran a tremendous risk, as the story of the Garden of Eden reveals. Likewise, when you and I chose to have children, we ran a great risk. This is life, and the way it ought to be. Therefore, we must accept reality, both its positive and negative aspect, if we are going to be mature and responsible people. But I have good news for you. Christian parents have the unique privilege to be in the sovereignty of God, regardless of the seemingly wasteful, stupid, dangerous, ungrateful, foolish, and immoral decisions humans may make. God is still sovereign Lord. Our actions, whether as parents or children, can all overrule God's sovereign control. Although God will not overrule our own wills, He always have the last word, whether of judgment or grace or both. <laughs> God is creator, sustainer, and lord of all the universe. For Christians, he is our savior, lord and king. He has not lost control of the world or of our family situation. Regardless of how dark things look in your home, God is still sovereign. We can trust him to work things out, although it will be with his methods and on his timetable. The God revealed in Jesus Christ can be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, Revelation 1, 8 and 17. Of, of your particular family dilemma, regardless of what has happened, is happening, or will happen between you and your children, you are still hold. You can still hold on to the sovereignty of God. One of the greatest affirmations of the sovereignty of God is Psalms 23. Read it every day for the next four weeks. It's faithful. It's faith will be contagious. A, parallel, a puzzle. 
passage. A verse from the Bible that has caused much confusion and perplexity for many wounded parents is Proverbs 22 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The words, the way he should go, literally means according to his way, that is, according to the child's personality, temperament, and aptitude. This proverb teaches that parental instruction should take into account the child's individuality and inclinations. Moreover, such instruction should be given with the child's current degree of physical and mental development in mind. The Good News Bible offers a helpful translation. Teach a child how he should live and he will remember it all his life. This verse suggests only that early training is important and that it will have long-term consequences. This verse is no guarantee that your definition, instruction, and example of the Christian life will cause your children to turn out just as you want them to. It offers no prophetic promise that if we take them to Sunday school and church, at, at church as children, that all will turn out to be our liking. It does not promise that there will be no rebellion, conflict, or difference. This verse simply reminds us that the early formative years of a child are the time to provide him or her with our best teaching and example and that he or she will never forget it. But this influence does not overrule the freedom of that child's own will or responsibility for his or her decisions. Our responsibility as parents is to do our best under God and trust Him to bring His will to pass in the light of the child's unique personality and God's purpose for that life. The God of hope and comfort. When their parents have to have hope in order to survive. Without hope, some of us will quickly despair. The only place to find hope for a perplexed family situation is with a God with is with God. He is the God of hope, and his word is a marvelous simulator of hope for the discouraged parents. A verse for Jeremiah comes to mind. There is hope for your future, says the Lord. Your children shall come back to their own country. That's Jeremiah 31:17. In addition, God is a God of comfort for parents in pain. Yet there is a sense of divine purpose that, that added to our suffering when God is allowed to deal with it. The God of comfort comforts us in order that we might be able to comfort other wounded parents with the same comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And just as we are sharing abundantly somehow in Christ's suffering, He identified with us. So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5. Consequently, the God of hope and comf comfort who is revealed in Jesus Christ enables us to go on living and become wounded healers. Questions for discussion for this part. How is God's experience as a wounded parent helpful to you? Does Jesus' experience with parental discouragements offer any guidance for your situation? How is Paul's experience relevant to you? How do you balance the freedom of man with the sovereignty of God in your family situation? Study various translations of and commentaries on Proverbs 22, 6. How do you apply this verse to your experience? How do you feel about the future in your family? Why? Do you have any plans of growth uh, and improvement? And so let's go on to um, destroying every new relationship. And this um, covers every angle of relationship. Elia would just dealt with things and then we're dealing with all kinds of relationship. Uh, destroying every relationship. I want it the way it has always been, but different. Using our life experiences as our basis, we establish a paradigm of the world. As we go through various experiences, we make judgments. In other words, we determine why these things happen. And because we have a sin nature, we always make that determination from a self-centered perspective. Why did that happen to me? When we were children, we tended to judge every experience in light of what it meant about us. Through a sin-feared nature, we interpreted every event in our lives as if it were all about us. Then we interpreted the world through our judgment of those experiences. Some studies indicate that our self-perception is established before we reach the age of five. That is early. Think about that. We developed our view of the world through our experiences and subjective judgment long before we ever reach adulthood. The scripture teaches that all children are born with a sin nature. This does not mean that every child is asked to be evil or commit sin. It simply means that every child is born inherently fearful, 
one leading child psychologist believes that fear is the only inborn emotion a child possesses. The sin nature revolves around self. Because the nature of fear is subjective, fear puts me at the center of person's experience. Therefore, the person with a sin nature interprets everything subjectively, making it all about me. We must renew our minds. Our subjective worldview is established before we are mature enough to realize that not everything is about us. Even when we do realize that not everything is about us, we fail to realize that our worldview was established in such a self-centered manner. We don't know where we go, got our view of the world, we just know that this is the way we see things and it forms the basis of our self-perception and all our actions. This is why it is so essential that believers renew their minds. We must interpret the world in the light of our new identity in Jesus. We must look at the world after we have placed him at the center. We can no longer be the metrics from which we determine our understanding of the world. We must release the world from our sinful self-centered judgment. That means we must reconsider all past interpretations and release our past judgment of all people and events. Otherwise, we will be locked into our current views and opinions, making it impossible for us to renew our minds. Our concepts of father, mother, mate, and uh, maybe even friend are already established. By our experiences and judgments, we have uh, to a certain degree cast our lot in life even before we reach poverty. Apart from a change of heart, most of our major decisions in life are predetermined by how we view the world and our circumstances. Children who grow up in homes where criticism is the norm will live the rest of their lives out of the judgment they make about criticism. A boy may judge, my mother criticized me because she loved me. That judgment may predetermine what kind of woman he will marry. When he longs for love, he will look for someone who criticizes him. After all, this is his judgment concerning his mother's criticism. Criticism equals love in his view, but then he cannot understand why he is miserable in this adult relationship. The girl who passes a judgment or criticism is a form of rejection will be forced in another direction. She will avoid anyone who attempts to add any quality or direction to her life. She may search out a mate who has no opinion, is afraid of confrontation, and never share his view. She will be doomed to a life with a non-communicator, unhappy with this person who seems so emotionless she doesn't understand why she was ever attracted to him. So I repeat that again. The girl who possesses a judgment that all criticism is a form of rejection will be forced in another direction. Okay, She will avoid anyone who attempts to add any quality or direction to her life. She may search out a mate who has no opinion, is afraid of confrontation, and ever shares his view. She could be doomed to a life with a non-communicator, unhappy with this person who seems to so emotionless. She doesn't understand why she was ever attacked, attracted to him. What relationships are really all about? Because we have already decided how the rules in life should be played out, we approach new relationships looking for our idea of a friend. We already have a definition of what type of person this will be. Much of this is done on a subconscious level. It is, however, clearly directing the course of our lives. And, and it all revolves around judgment. This explains why, when teaching about the heart, Jesus said that what we have, we will get more of, whether good or bad. Mark 4, 24, 25. Unless we sow the word in our hearts and change the beliefs of our hearts, we are doomed to repeat the patterns of our past and relive the same painful experience. Relationship could be places of personal development. They should challenge and stimulate us. They should open us to the many new facets of life. When we get to know new and different people, we have the opportunity to go to grow as never before. Our problem, however, is that we pass so many judgments before we really get to know new people that we seldom allow those outside of our paradigm into our emotional circle. We have views of what is good, of what is a good friend and what is a bad friend. Those views were established by judgment we made throughout our lives. Based on our views, we will accept or reject a new acquaintance before ever getting to know the person. 
This is why people fall into repetitive patterns in their relationship. They have already decided what kind of person they will accept and what kind of person they will reject. This is part of what locks us into following the same destructive patterns in relationship. Most studies agree that people will never sustain lasting change unless they are resocialized. The Bible is very clear about the effect that fellowship and socialization have on our thoughts and actions. People who make good decisions never see them through to the end unless they are socially involved with people who can emotionally support those decisions. Unfortunately, our judgment keeps us in the same social circles all our lives, making change virtually impossible. In this system of socialization, we stay with a predetermined comfort zone. In other words, we keep it the way it has always been and then wonder why nothing changes. Because we are not interacting with different types of people, we are never challenged. We are not forced to grow. When we meet and are attracted to new people, they are the same kinds of people as the old friends from the past. Only the names and appearance have changed. For the person who is struck in unhealthy relationship, this circle falsely confirms their fears and suspicions. They actually come to believe that all people are the same. In other words, they think there is no reality beyond my past experience. And after all, every person I get involved with is just like the people I have already known. Thus, judgment about all men, all women, all whites, all blacks, and so on are falsely reinforced. We need new relationships with different kinds of people in order to grow and break out of past patterns. We need people with different behavioral styles. We need people with different levels of character. We need to grow to accept all different types of people. Not every direct person will hurt you. Not everything about inspirational people is bad. Get to know new people and avoid a repeat performance of past pains. And uh, that brings us uh, to the end of episode 22. Uh, Wounded parents, God continued parenthood and destroying every new relationship because of the mindset that we have formed in the past. So, Father, we just want to thank you for bringing us to the end of this. We ask that you bless it. May this word go and begin to um, uh, sort our relationship issues and cause us to live in harmony in the mighty name and, and break down walls of conflict in our relationship in the name of Jesus. Thank you for answer prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.